hopefully you read uh, Adam's and Melissa's bios earlier um, while you were before the before I got on and started talking. Um, Adam is a um, professor uh, re of resource economics in the School of Forestry up at uh, UMaine Orono. I met him a few years, three years ago, maybe at a Sebago Lake Symposium. We talked about, uh, we talked in the hallway about um, natural resources economics. He had given a presentation and I said, we should, um, we should really look at this um, great Ponds task force study from the 90s. I, we really want to see it redone. And he said, yeah, sure. And it's one of those things that you talk to someone about and, um, you know, a couple of years goes by, a couple of years go by, and then we reconnected again, and we had a successful Outdoor Heritage Fund grant that got it going, and so um, was, I'm really pleased that that hall, conversation in the hallway years ago has paid off um, with the current work that's being done. Um, and Melissa, who's working with him, she's a student at UMO. Uh, she also works for the Friends of the Cobbacy Watershed in the summertime and um, is passionate about lake protection. And um, I know when Adam hired her and I connected with the Friends of Cobbacy Watershed folks, they just raved about her and her um, academics and her drive and passion. So I'm really excited that Melissa got on board with this project. Just quickly, my connection, the theme of our webinar series is uh, the celebrating 50 years of the Clean Water Act. So I just put this slide up there to remind everybody, you know, it's it's kind of a no-brainer, but, you know, voter, I, I put this up, I did a talk earlier today on voter education, so I was just looking at the voting, uh, economic impact of voting and the value that boats and uh, purchasing boats and gas and all of those things, um, the contribution that makes to our economy, which is huge, uh, almost 40 billion in uh, North America in 2020. And then I want to remind people, I think I've used this slide almost every webinar, but remind people of when the Clean Water Act came about in 1972. This is the kind of waterways we were looking at. And the connection to the Clean Water Act today really is, is pretty, pretty obvious. Uh, this kind of water is not going to bring about economic values. You were, people are not going to invest a lot of money in a nice boat or um, a place to live on this kind of water. And so um, just reminding people that, uh, you know, and, and Adam and Melissa will talk about valuing how we value lakes. And of course, um, and this is, connects back to our lake book. Our lake book is dedicated. Uh, this, this edition is dedicated to the youth of Maine. So I thought it was good to put up our, this is a page from the lake book to remind people that all of these things we do, these are all things we value, but they also have um, um, a, a real economic value to them as well. And you can see all these um, kids are enjoying clean water and none of them would be doing any of these things if we didn't have the clean water in place to protect this, um, not only natural resource, but economic resource for our state. So with that, um, I will stop and pass it over to you, Adam. Thanks so much for doing this. Great, thank you, Susan. Yeah, it's great to be here. And um, let me echo also um, just the praise for Melissa and all the work that she has done. I was just uh, expressing that, um, you know, when she first submitted her, her resume, I kind of did a double take. I, I didn't believe that there was actually someone here at UMaine who had, was available to work on a project like this, who had real world experience and that sort of level of sort of excitement, knowledge and dedication. And I think since then you had not little to no economic background, but you sort of, I've convinced you yeah. to sort of drink the Kool-Aid and now she's interested in taking more courses and, and all that and sort of bringing, bridging together both the ecology and the, the uh, economic aspect. So that's really, really fantastic. All right, so let me see if I can get this up and going. Uh, uh, and can everyone see the full set of slides? Yep, and I'll just remind people too, um, I usually say this, but I forgot, um, just, uh, you know, the chat's great for um, conversation and I can, I see your, um, um, somebody's first grade teacher, Mrs. Bender is on the call. So you should probably know that. Oh my um, gosh. Wow. Yes. Yeah. Lincolnville Central School. 
<laughs> yeah. Fantastic. So, so great to hear from you. Yeah. Yeah. So chat's good for that. And then any questions specifically that you want Adam or Melissa to answer, use the Q&A function. So thanks so much. Okay. All right. Well, fantastic. Now I really know that if Mrs. Bender's on the on the uh, on the line, that I have to be my best behavior. So she was she was good at uh, keeping me in line and, and dedicated. And, and look where it turned out. Here I am here at the University of Maine talking about valuing the economic benefits of Maine's great ponds in the 21st century. Um, so as I noted, I'm Adam Dagno, I'm associate professor of forest policy economics here at the University of Maine, and I'm joined by. I'm um, Melissa Genoder, and I'm an undergrad here at UMaine. So, and we're going to very much do a sort of a tag team approach. So, um, you know, there's a couple of slides. Most will talk, then I'll chime in and we'll, we're really kind of, it'll go back and forth type thing like that. It's a very much a tag team approach. So without further ado, here we go. Right. Um, so as Susan touched on before, our um, economic valuation that we're doing now is based on one called, that was valuing Maine's Great Ponds back in the 90s. And Great Ponds just refers to lakes and ponds throughout the state. That was just the term they chose. Um, and these projects were collaborations between the Economics Department here at UMaine, the Water Research Institute here at UMaine, and the Maine DEP. So the value of $11 billion that you're seeing on the slide, that is adjusted to 2022 value. That's what Maine's lakes were valued at um, back in the 90s. And you can see about $5 billion of that was coming from direct and indirect sales. And here we are in 2022. A lot has changed in the past 25 years, um, particularly climate change has intensified especially over the past decade. And then we have things like invasive species threatening our water, like milfoil. And then in the past few years, the COVID pandemic has been, meant a lot more housing and recreation demands as people are moving on to and increasingly playing on our lakes. So now more than ever, we think it's important to see how these changes have affected the value of these lakes. So the question we have here is uh, how exactly do we value Maine's lakes? So as um, Susan alluded to, a lot of the value or the, a lot of things that we sort of uh, attribute to lakes have a lot to do with water clarity and water quality, right? So if you go to a lake and you can, a lot of times you can perceive about how sort of clean or dirty it is by the way it looks. It's also things like how it smells, what amenities may be there. Those are all sort of uh, deriving sort of the attractiveness or the relative um, uh, sort of level of quality that you might associate with the lakes. Now, those values are probably also, you know, the what level of clarity and quality are also affected about things like uh, various drivers. So what type of nutrients and sediment are in those lakes? Um, maybe what types of invasive species are growing and how that might be affecting uh, largely not just the sort of aesthetic views, but the recreational opportunities we have. Uh, we also talked about how climate change may be affecting sort of the rate of, of, of change in these lakes in terms of what can grow there and what species sort of can, can, can survive. Uh, and then finally, you know, what Maine Lakes is all about is sort of um, ways to think about how we can introduce uh, various aspects of sort of lake and land management to sort of protect or enhance the water quality. Those drivers, like I said, affect water quality, and then that themselves are going to be basically what really are driving the sort of economic values or the sort of benefits that we can derive from these lakes, right? And so some of the things that we can think about, which we're going to touch upon today, are aspects of clean drinking water that come from surface water sources, industrial uh, and commercial water use, uh, home values associated with those uh, uh, either right on the lakefront or nearby, all the sort of recreational benefits we get from recreating in and around lakes. Um, summer camps are a big business here in Maine as well, and sort of the summer, many of the summer camps are located uh, right alongside uh, uh, various lakes. And then finally, also what Susan talked about when she was talking about sort of the value of recreation, it's not just about the activities we do, but the amount that we spend to, to undertake those activities um, and, uh, and, and sort of like go to places, uh, buy food, buy equipment, all those types of things. Those also sort of can feed into, uh, into our recreation and sort of lake-based economy. So as Adam just touched upon, um, if we're going to measure the value of lakes, we first need to start with measuring their water quality. And to do that, we use um, Secchi Disc. Um, to measure the clarity of the water. And probably many of you on this call are familiar with it, but, and it's a pretty simple method. So as you see on the slide, we would use a metal disc um, that has uh, white and black parts on it, and it's lowered down into the water column of the lake um, until it's no longer visible. So the depth at which that disc disappears is called the Secchi depth. So we're just essentially measuring the visibility depth. And this can be affected by things like turbidity of water, um, what plants and nutrients are growing in it, and if there's any suspended sediments or algae. 
Um, and so as the graph on the right side of the sh slide shows, there's the greater the Secchi depth is, the higher a water body will have uh, will be on the water quality index. And the data that we're using, um, all the Secchi data is compiled through the main DP and the main volunteer lake monitoring program. So there's people, volunteers that go out all over the state and collect these readings and they're sent back to the DEP so that we can use them. So when we keep talking about sort of economics of uh, lakes and water quality, really what we're referring to is a couple sort of different different ways that we can sort of get at that. But the real big picture that a lot of people say when they say Maine's lakes are worth $11 billion, they're often trying to get at what we call total economic value. And what exactly is total economic value? Well, it's sort of a mix of both the use values and the non-use values that we get from lakes. And so our use value, those are ones that we can often sort of understand best because these are the things that we're actually doing through, through activities in and around lakes. So you can think of direct use values. Those are things like recreation, right? Fishing, um, in the, or, or again, fishing not just for recreation, but also potentially for subsistence and for food, right? So we can directly pull fish out of the lake and consume them. Or drinking water, right? So, uh, you know, number of uh, um, water districts here in Maine are reliant on uh, surface drinking water, which are essentially the reservoirs or the sources come from our lakes. We can also have indirect use value, right? And so that might be habitat, right? So habitat itself is then pro uh, providing for abundance of, or sort of, uh, of species, right? That then serves other sort of functions that then basically drive us to want to go and recreate or fish in a certain area. Or if you think about it, for you know, go to certain places where you have the uh, prominent viewscapes, the aesthetics created by that uh, sort of the, the lake and its ecosystem can provide that sort of um, sort of that indirect uh, use. On the non-use side, we're really thinking about existence value, right? So it's the value we sort of derive from not necessarily using a specific lake, but knowing that there might be a rare species in there or other aspects of of, of just knowing that you know Maine's lakes are clean and clean and green. So you might want to think about sort of what, for one perspective, rare species could be landlocked salmon in certain air and certain um, lakes within Maine, right? And so though, although you may not be, um, you know, a, a recreator or, or have ever seen sort of uh, uh, landlocked salmon wire out on a lake, right? You might get uh, might get value just knowing that they're that they're uh, that they're out there, um, and that there's programs in place to sort of um, continue to sort of um, ensure that they that they exist. The third thing we can think about is what's called option value. And that's again, that you might not be using it right now, right? But the idea that you could have the option to use, use whatever that lake is to, uh, to basically in the future, right? And so if our lakes get sort of to a tipping point where they're so over polluted that certain, certain species go extinct or other uses basically cannot be sort of brought back into, into sort of utilization, right? And then, then you might not have that option of what you can do with that lake in a later, in a later period. So, and all these things can tie into things about use and non-use uh, as well. So the question is, you know, we have, you know, uh, you know, a few dozen people on the line right now. And the question is, what do you value about main lakes and ponds, right? And so we've, we've had, um, you know, we've talked about things about drinking water, uh, home, home values, particularly associated with the sort of opportunities you get from uh, viewing the lake or, again, directly using it. Uh, there's the sort of habitat potential. We talked about summer camp, other recreation opportunities, right? But I'm sure you can think of many, many more. And so there's going to be an opportunity sort of at the end where we have a bit more interactive uh, component of this, uh, of the webinar for you to sort of uh, chime in on other things that we could think about uh, to value beyond this sort of the core uh, focus of, of our study, which is largely um, a replication of the study that was conducted 25 years ago. So you might think, you know, I talk a lot about sort of use and, and non-use and direct use and indirect use, right? But the big key thing about a lot of the things that we do on lakes, you don't necessarily, you know, pay right out of your wallet at that very moment to, you know, ex access a lake or, you know, go swimming and things like that, right? But there are things that, that, that basically they still bring value to you, even though you might not be spending money on that activity immediately at that time. And so the key... Key thing we need to understand here is that we can do market valuation, but we can also do non-market valuation to get up sort of what else some of these other values may be. So market valuation, those can think about uh, things that you directly, you, pro you often think about in that sort of day-to-day -day basis. So this could be represented by market price or, or avoided damages. So one thing you can say, well, what's some value you get out of lake? Well, the, uh, the, the ability to basically, um, you know, launch your boat and go fishing. Um, so, and then you might catch some fish and consume them, right? So the direct value might be the actual sort of um, 
cost that you would pay equivalently to, uh, you know, if you bought that fish in a marketplace. Um, another one we could think about is avoided damages. And what we might think about there is that um, there's several main lakes that also have what we call a, a drinking water filtration waiver. And that basically means that you don't have to have a certain um, type of filtration plant to basically uh, filter out uh, nutrients and other aspects of the drinking water that then actually allows, uh, allows uh, certain water districts to actually charge less uh, for their water, right? And so by having that sort of clean, um, you know, uh, high quality water in the lakes, right, you're actually avoiding, uh, you know, basically in keeping that clean, you're avoiding the damages or the additional costs that you might have to pay uh, if the water was degraded to a certain degree that you had to put in a filtration plant. On the MARN market side, there's sort of two ways that we look at this. One is what we call the, a surrogate market or revealed preference. And that's basically largely through surveys and observations. We're basically getting at what people's uh, values are for things that they purchase that we're not looking exactly at what they purchase, but why they purchase them, right? And associating certain things with that. So you might think about uh, someone purchasing a home along uh, uh, that has a certain shorefront. And the idea is that they might want to pay more if basically that lake has a, a higher quality relative to all other things. Or another one is travel costs. And that's the idea that we might want to travel farther or travel more often to places that have higher amenities, right? Because we're willing to use that sort of both time and the actual physical cost of traveling to go there because we're going to derive more value or benefits from that. The other side is that, so those are all sort of um, what we say we can be observed, right? You can actually see people going and making these choices by doing purchasing or traveling somewhere. On the other side, we can actually come up with hypothetical markets, which are called stated preferences, and we can just ask people what their preferences might be, right? Come up with hypothetical cases, like how much would you be willing to pay to uh, reduce the milfoil from this lake, you know, on, in terms of increasing your taxes per year? Or if you had the choice over sort of three different options, right? Which, which one would you choose, noting that maybe it might cost you a little bit more to have a certain level of water quality above and beyond what it is today? To expand upon a couple of the key um, techniques that uh, are common to sort of natural resource and environmental economics, then we're going to utilize sort of in a, in a later part of our study. This one, again, um, press upon this sort of uh, the, um, the use of travel costs and hedonic pricing models. So left-hand side, travel cost is really just getting at, it's the value associated with recreational sites that are estimated from visitor numbers and travel distance. And so the logic behind here is that generally, the farther away you are from a given site, the less often that you're going to visit it, right? But if that site has such a, a you know, relatively high level of quality, you might actually travel more than, than you know, uh, somewhere close by. Uh, that doesn't have that same level of quality, right? And that's because you're willing to pay more, derive more of a value from those sites that have better environmental quality or maybe other sort of amenities associated with it. On a hedonic pricing model, that's looking at the value of ecosystems that are linked to market goods, all right? In this case, we're saying namely property, right? And so the idea here is if you look at this scenario is that sort of we have the same house that is exactly the same characteristics, but we have sort of different levels of amenities or uh, disamenities around the house that are gonna drive what the, what the home sale value may be. So you can think of basically a house that has a lot of traffic nearby, but also uh, proximity to sort of a stream and forest might sell for 125,000, which is the same value that that same house might be, but without the sort of amenity and dis disamenity nearby. Now, again, that same house that doesn't have the traffic nearby, but it's still close to the lake and stream uh, and, and, and uh, forest, people are actually gonna be willing to pay more and that extra $25,000 can be attributed not to the house because it's the same level of quality and size, but it's actually because they're close to these other amenities that they can derive value from. You know, on the counter to that is the more disamenities around it, the less people are willing to pay for that uh, because, of, of, because of the sort of associated fads uh, in that area. Um, just to touch upon this is that, you know, these types of techniques are not unique to just sort of the 1990 Maine study. This is another study that just came out of um, uh, the Chesapeake Bay area that's basically looking at what the Nant Nanticoke River is worth. And they looked at a number of natural benefits that sort of can be derived from, um, from that sort of, and there they're focused on a river, but it's really, again, the watershed and the, and the value that the water provides. And so they looked at things like the public parks that are around it, the forest and what they generate. Uh, fish and wildlife that um, that basically be, can 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 be harvested as a result of the the clean waters recreation water supply and then also there's a a, a good amount of irrigation for agriculture that's also uh, taking place in that in that region.
Great. So with all of those different methods of evaluation that Adam just touched on in mind, um, I wanted to just look at what the original 1990s study um, considered for uses. So their four main focuses were on recreation, um, other uses, lakefront property, and indirect sales. And I'll go into each of those a little bit more. So recreation, they looked at um, swimming, fishing, boating, and hunting, which are the main um, activities that happen on main lakes. And they'll use things like government government reports and surveys from federal and state agencies to determine how many people are doing these activities and how much they're spending to do them. And as you can see from the table, that comes out to just under um, $346,000 in value. Um, as for other uses, they looked at things like water districts, so how much water um, drinking wa revenue drinking water is bringing in and how much commercial users are using. And they Within this category, they also looked at summer camps. So they considered earlier studies that looked at daily expenditures from campers at these camps. And other uses accounts for about 191 million in value. Um, as far as lakefront property, as I'm touched on a little bit, um, they're looking at values that property has because of its location on a lake, not just its amenities. So they're taking out things like the size of a house and how many bedrooms it might have, and just looking at values like what they're paying in waterfront taxes and the purchases and maintenance specific to living on a lake. So if you have to pay for erosion control or taking care of your dock. And this is a big part of the net economic value. As you can see, it accounts for 10 billion out of the total 11 billion. And then the last piece of it is indirect sales. So that's looking at multiplier effects, things like jobs created as lots of people are in the state and we need things like employees um, for lifeguards or to work at shops where people are buying food and gear. Um, so that comprises that final part there. Yeah, so the big question here is if this is based on sort of that study 25 years ago, we're assuming we're probably thinking that because this is already adjusted for inflation that the overall value is probably going to be in the same level of magnitude. But the question is, have these numbers sort of been redistributed such that um, maybe there's sort of like the relative influence of recreation compared to lakefront properties has changed, right? Or are there other sort of uses that sort of weren't in existence 25 years ago that maybe are, are in existence now that are, are again going to have a, a different effect uh, on the relative sort of value of our lakes? So keeping in mind those shifting valuations that we just talked about, um, we want to, going forward, reframe the project within the framework, uh, the value framework that we kind of discussed earlier. So that starts with looking at drivers, like we talked about, like nutrients, species, species, climate change, how those change, and then how do those affect water clarity? And water cl clarity, as we know, will affect the economics. It will change how people perceive the quality of the water, which determines where they choose to spend their time and money recreating, buying houses, or sending their kids to summer camp. And the our aim in this study is to figure out how much this water clarity changes the economic values of lakes. And once we have this information, we can get to the stakeholder outreach stage, so share our findings with the public, um, as well as government agencies and, um, and nonprofits, so that we as individuals and as policymakers can decide how we want to manage the individual drivers that we started with um, to have the best possible outcome for water quality and for our economy here in Maine. So as we touched on before, we're drawing from the original uh, um, factors that were considered in, this, in the 1990s study. So we just wanted to give you an overview of those original methods. Um, so now we're, we're continuing to look at recreation uses and using data from places like, from state agencies to determine how many people per year are participating in these activities and how are they spending, uh, how much money are they spending while they're doing these. And then we're looking at things like recreational drinking water, which we touched on a little bit. So how many million gallons are being consumed? And we can look at, again, state data for that um, through the DEP and other um, state agencies. Another huge component is youth camps. And we have a lot of those in Maine. So we've been using the Maine Summer Camps resource to see how many campers are in Maine and how much tuition are they paying. And as well as looking at industrial and commercial users. So not only are individuals using water, we have lots of mills and other commercial interests using water in Maine. And we can also uh, use EPA and other main data to look at that. And then as we saw, lakefront property is a huge contributor to our economic value. We can use online resources like Zillow and Redfin to figure out how much are people paying for their lakefront property. Um, and another thing that was very interesting from the 1990 study is that they used sizes of sample lakes um, to look at 
took a real estate data based on these certain markets around the state, and they chose those based on where there was water quality monitoring for. So as you can see, it's kind of a limited number of groups. Um, and also this is the 90s, so they didn't have as much um, technology available to process all this data. So now today we have 20 more years of monitoring. We have a lot more SECI data, and we also have tons of great websites um, that we can find property data a lot more easily and the technology to process it. So we're hoping that as we move forward in our study, we can consider a wider range of lakes throughout the state to have a more reflective um, value. And as I touched on before, um, we're using water quality as an indicator of clarity from Secchi Desks. And we'd like to highlight that in the 90s, they found that 36% uh, increase in the average minimum water clarity led to a 30% increase in that economic value, which is two billion, which accounts for $2 billion. So it's very clear from this data that water quality and clarity does drive economic value. So one of the great things about having the DEP database is that we can look at how the clarity has changed over time and look at what the clarity is now to see how the current clarity and um, different economic values are correlated with each other. So that aspect of clarity around lakes has a huge impact on what housing values may be. At least that was the finding in the previous study and it has been a uh, finding in, in a number of studies that have been conducted, not just uh, in, in Maine, but throughout the Northeast and the US in general. As I noted, these are estimated using what we call hedonic pricing models. And really what we're trying to do is measure the effect of water quality on lakefront home values, all else held equal. And what we mean by all else held equal is that basically, if you just took that same house and you moved it to another lake, such that with it had all the same amenities, but water quality was different, how, how would, uh, how would the, uh, the overall value of that house and the property change? Um, as you know, as, as we talked about, it was close to $10 billion um, in terms of total economic value is produced um, on an annual basis from main shorefront homes. And the previous study looked at basically what's the effect of sort of changing um, water clarity by plus or minus one meter. And they found, again, depending on what lake you're on or what region you were in, they could have a three to 9% change in shorefront property value. So you can think about that in this day and age. You know, most houses now are probably selling up for 500,000 to a million, right? That could be upwards of, of close to, um, you know, $100,000 difference just for one meter change in water clarity, right? But the key here is that you have to use a, a lot of data and a number of statistical sort of um, uh, methods to really capture what the effect is on the water clarity, right? Relative to these other sort of amenities like where the lake is located, where the house is located on the lake. Um, what school district that might be in, property taxes, number of bedrooms, number of bathrooms, all those other things that might also drive why someone might be willing to pay more or less for a given home. Um, for example, um, this uh, study just to show is something that was carried out in, um, in the city of Coeur d'Alene, uh, Idaho. But basically what they're looking at is, you know, you can do hypotheticals or you can actually derive this from real world uh, things, right? Depending on the size of the lake or how many lakes you're looking at. In our case, we're going to look over a, a, a several, several um, dozen lakes. Is that, uh, you know, you can think about what happens if an invasive weed is decreasing lake aesthetics, right? And to do that, you can locate it in this case where basically the milfoil is being present and that's the southern half of the lake. And you get the data on a bunch of property prices, property characteristics, and an indicator for whether the invasive is impacting that part of the lake or not. And by looking up and down the entire lake and getting, uh, getting property values and transactions that have been occurring over a number of years, you can conduct statistical analysis and find out what is the true value of basically not having milfoil um, sort of in, in, your, in, your lo in the location nearby your property. Okay, another thing that we can talk about is recreation demand, right? And these are activities like boating, fishing, swimming, and hunting, right? And those are the key ones that we looked at before and probably the ones that you can mostly think of that can occur in Maine, right? Fishing can both be during summer and, and, and winter time, um, right? Whereas probably, well, in both cases, it's going to be affected by quality, right? But maybe in the summer, you're going to have a slightly different perspective on, on the quality versus winter. But again, we can do this where we estimate based on this travel cost approach where higher quality or better amenities are gonna attract more people and or people who are willing to travel farther to get that. And so by doing the sort of survey-based estimates where we collect information on where people go, where they came from, 
how much they spent and how long they spent there. Um, studies often get sort of values in this range that are sort of ranging from $20 to $40 for swimming to upwards of uh, $40 to $80 for freshwater fishing, right? And this is per person per day trip, right? So that's the idea is that often you're going to go to visit a lake multiple times in a year, or even if you don't go to one lake, you might do a number of sort of activities on lakes throughout the year that then these are going to add up on a per person basis. The other thing as well is to note that with something like swimming, right, you're probably not going to go there all day long. So the sort of opportunity cost or value of your time might be might be weighted a little bit lower, which is why that value might not be as high as something like swimming, particularly if you're, I mean, uh, something like fishing, particularly if you're fishing out on a boat or something like that, where that activity is probably going to be much longer than, say, the same activity of swimming in that given day. Um, the other thing that uh, you can think about is that before the other previous slides were all sort of about values, right? And so that's sort of the implicit value that we might place on sort of where, our, where, where, where we're located in terms of our property or what lakes we're going to and what activities we're doing on it. But we can also track the actual expenditures that we might spend on if we go and do a specific type of trip on a lake, right? Or, or, or buying equipment associated with that. Um, or anything like that. And so the previous study, again, looked at swimming, fishing, hunting, and boating, and looked at basically surveying people and asked them how much they spent uh, on, on various aspects of their activity, absent of their time, just the actual equipment, whether they went out to restaurants, they had to buy fuel, they might have purchased sort of clothing, other things, uh, if they went on tours or something like that, had guides, all that stuff can be captured in sort of what we call these daily, daily expenditure type um, tricycle assessment. And so with that, that's where they estimated that overall aggregate expenditures for recreation in the previous study, unadjusted for inflation, was close to a billion dollars per year, with the highest value coming from boating equipment, followed by swimming and then non-motor and non-motor boating, right? So slightly different than sort of the value someone might get when they, when they actually get there. This might be with the swimming trip, you might go swimming for a little while, but then you're going to decide to basically stay and go somewhere for lunch, right? Or maybe go hiking afterwards or something like that, combine your trips but you can still attribute a lot of the expenditure to, to swimming. The other thing that was to note is that back in the 1990s, you know, 90% of the expenditures, right, in aggregate were faced by uh, residents of Maine as opposed to non-residents. It'd be really interesting to see, again, in the time of COVID, whether or not this sort of proportion or distribution still holds the same. So, so far we've talked a lot about people, or at least in last slide, spending money directly, you know, going to lakes. But even if people aren't visiting lakes, they still may be paying for their services through drinking water. So there are about 35 water districts throughout the state that use a surface water source. So you can see some of those on the map um, on the right of your screen. So that means that um, water districts and towns are directly pulling water from these freshwater lakes. Um, and so this information is all freely available through the Maine Public Utilities Commission. So it's easy to compile the report for compile the different reports for revenue water and see how much um, residential and commercial users, how much money they're spending and bringing into the state. So um, we found that it's an average, um, on average, it's bringing about $100 million per year. Um, and like we noted before, this can change based on how clean the water is. Like um, districts like Bangor and Brewer, they actually have water filtration waivers, so they don't need to spend time and money filtering out water that is taken from these um, from these clean lakes. And then another thing we're looking to measure is um, summer camps in Maine. So there are over 150 summer camps in Maine. Um, we found 91 of them that are located on lakes and ponds, and these draw in tens of thousands of campers every summer. So summer camps are obviously a big part of the culture and economy surrounding lakes. And we're currently looking at this in our study by measuring the number of campers that are at camp for summer and how much they're spending to be there. So tuition at some of these camps can get very high, as much as $2,000 per camper per week. So we're looking at potentially hundreds of millions of dollars in value brought in by summer camps that are on main lakes and ponds. And obviously we've talked, of, uh, there's a lot of values that we've looked at, but there are plenty of other values that may not be as easy to consider. Um, and we're aware that we haven't covered all of them. So some things that we have also talked about are winter activities like skating, winter festivals, I talk here, ice boat races. And also very important are cultural values. And these are a large part of non-market valuation 
so especially for indigenous communities have, who have been connected to these lakes as part of their cultural identity and traditions for centuries. And lakes are also a valuable education tool as well. Um, I work with friends with Cogsey Watershed in the summer, and I know we have tab pool patrol and day camps, so getting kids out onto the lakes um, in boats and they can look down and see the fish and the tab pool swimming around and understand um, how important these lakes are and how they work. So values like these are also important to consider, but um, and we're still figuring out how to do that. And we would welcome any contributions or suggestions you have. Um, so what aspects of main lakes do you value? That's really it. As, as Susan noted, it's basically thanks to the main, uh, main Outdoor Heritage Fund, we got a bit of a seed grant uh, to uh, bring Melissa on board and to get Susan and myself talking, uh, along with Linda Bacon, uh, DEP, and, and a few others who sort of either have been active uh, in this space for quite some time, starting to do outreach like we are, um, you know, with engaging through this webinar and other things. But really, a lot of the actual number crunching is just sort of coming over the next year. So we still have to do the lakeshore property value uh, modeling. We're, we're aggregating all that data right now. Um, you know, we've started doing the water use and summer camp value monetization, but we still want to refine that, particularly at, uh, try to get at sort of a more uh, sort of granular level uh, at the in terms of sort of the lake regions that Melissa was talking about. Um, We've already started designing uh, an, uh, a lake perception recreation expenditure survey, and that's something that we're hoping to distribute next fall. Um, the key there is that we're going to put it out to people who are frequent uh, lake users, but also those who maybe not will not use it necessarily uh, as frequently as we might think. And so the idea is to get at sort of what drives lake use um, and, what, uh, and, and what might actually be sort of a constraint or inhibit some people's use, right? And sort of getting at sort of the equity perspectives and other things that we can think of in terms of what uh, what Maine's lakes provide. Um, we definitely want to differentiate eight estimates by lake and region so you have a better idea of sort of where the hot spots may be for different sort of values that we may have, and then uh, ultimately doing public outreach and engagement as well. Um, there's a fire alarm going off outside, so uh, we might have to vacate early, and I may have to push it over to uh, Susan to do any sort of um, uh, moderating, but this is this is it. I just again want to thank uh, to all our collaborators and funders, um, and welcome any questions or comments. We can also join from my laptop outside. If that's that's that right. We could try to book. go outside. Yeah. Okay. okay well, this is a first. Um, a fire alarm uh, interrupting a webinar is a first. Okay. Well, Melissa has a good point that what we're going to do is so Susan. I guess I would let leave you to to um sort of facilitate, ask people what else they're thinking. I know you and I have been talking for a while about what else we could do, what, what angles there are, what's missing, what data may, people may have. Melissa and I will go out to the courtyard and see if we can uh, <laughs> sign back in um, or go to we can go to the other building. So okay. I'm going to pass it over to you and we will uh, hopefully be back soon. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for being creative with us. All right, folks. Well, now I'm on the spot. Um, and I don't know, I guess we got to kill a little time until Adam gets back. Um, uh, let's see, I'm not exactly <laughs> sure what I should do in his absence. Um, I guess I'm trying to decide if I should just make it, we turn this into a meeting and just have everybody, I think I'll do that. Um, yeah, I think that's a good idea. All right. So can we make so them if, if people right. want to join, raise your hands and we can have a little discussion. Um and we'll 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 let you in. If you just want to sit in the background and observe, that's fine as well. But if, if anyone wants to join, please raise your hand now. Yeah, and you can you don't have to turn on your video. So if you can still join and not and turn your video off. So um, we need to figure out how to let people in now. So hang on. Oh, here we go. All right. See if I can get to them before you can. Before I got them. Lauren is in. John is in. Adam is in. Oh, all Davis. All right. Oh, I'm clicking.
what happened? Did I do something wrong? No. All right. I'll watch the board if you want to get the conversation going there, Susan. Okay. Well, um, I think actually, was it, uh, somebody asked about, um, was it was it you, John, that asked about alum treatments? Well, I, I wasn't asking, but I said- um, Commenting. Yeah, it was. So you want me to repeat that? Sure. Um, yeah, and I'll just tell you, Adam, we decided to just promote people on so that we could see some faces and have some better discussion. So anybody wants to join us is getting promoted to panelist. And um, yeah, go ahead, John. He, John brought up um, alum treatments, which have a big impact. Yeah, so um, we, uh, we use this principle of the relationship between water quality and property value um, on our lake project, we had some algal blooms and we had to raise um, a lot of money, $350,000 to treat it with alum. And we said, um, you know, we encouraged ponders to contribute 2% of their property value um, to get a potential 10% return on their investment. And, um, you know, I'm glad to report that we were able to raise the money. We did the alum treatment um, and we have the clearest water we've ever had. So, I mean, obviously that's not all we're doing. There's a lot of lake stewardship and 319 grants and lake smarts and everything else to make it last. But this whole principle of uh, the relationship was uh, extremely useful to us. Yeah, that's that's great to know, right? And then you're not the first one I've heard about sort of um, the relative value of alum treatment, right? Relative to um, both the you know quick way to get the quality back up, right? But also just having people recognize that 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 action. So uh, yeah, perfect. Right. It 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 was uh, you know I, I just want to disengage it a, a a little bit from the alum treatment. It was a way to kind of overcome the tragedy of the commons and get people to invest in a common good and that would have a resulting benefit for them. So, you know, it could be for us, it was alum, but it could be, you know, a new dam or a new road or anything else by, by improving, you know, the common good, you're actually going to improve your own direct benefit. Yeah, that's a great point, John. That's a great approach. Um, Adam Zeman, um, I think I've given you permission to talk. Uh, Hello there. Can hey, there me? you are. Hi, Adam. Hi, Go thank ahead. you very much. Uh, super interesting and very needed uh, update on the economic research from back in the 90s. I'm so thankful you're doing this. Um, my, my question relates, I don't know if you can see it in the chat, it relates to uh, sort of a reverse causation in stakeholder outreach, stakeholder outreach potentially affecting economic valuation. Uh, could you speak to that? Yep. So um, I think there was the arrow at the bottom that brought it back to the beginning. So okay. we are acknowledging that there is a cycle, right? Okay. And our process right now is sort of, and that's why we're asking like, what do you value and things like that, right? So that's, that's like, that's approach is trying to feed in um, so it's, I 100% agree with, with the, what, what you're getting at, um, because again, it's also not just the information you get in, but how you present it, right? And who res how it resonates with, with various stakeholders and things like that is, um, is also important, right? And so you can do the study, but if you don't really, aren't really taking into account what people truly think and doing as an academic exercise, then it's not going to be nearly as, as useful. Just to follow up on that, uh, what is the statistical mathematical modeling that you would be using to operationalize that to operationalize which part the the the, the cause the the sort of the non-linear causation right um, oh, how, that, how do you how are you able to factor that into your math essentially but uh the input from actual people or or from yeah. from which the, aspect? The, the change that it could occur as stakeholder outreach occurs 
Right. So you can basically have relative, I mean, the way I would do it is the same way we've done it before is look at relative changes in water quality, right? And so plus or minus one meter or in any case, right? And then you can look at what the effect may, may be. Now, then you have to use the other sort of statistical models that we're using, like for the housing value relative to water quality. Those will help us get what those, whether those functions are linear or, or nonlinear. Um, is okay. what we think about it. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Uh, somebody asked about um, looking when you're looking at the value of homes, and and I sort of realized that sort of every piece of this of what you've done so far that like each piece could be like a master's thesis on it standing on its own. So I know we're asking a lot of you in this in this study and in the coming year that where where we have the additional funding. Um, I know there's way more work than um, you know. These things sound simple, like ah, oh, just take home values and you know yeah. run it through a model. And I you know I'm full. I I get and people should understand um, how how much work is involved. And um, there were a couple economic studies in the at the water and sustainability conference a couple weeks ago, including one of your students. Adam yep. and you know it was it was interesting to talk to those students about sort of like how how long did it take you and how much work is this and the answer I came away with was this, this is a lot of work all of this valuation stuff that you're doing but that said are you is there a way to look at well there's two um home questions one is about seasonal homes um the value of seasonal homes versus year-round homes and um, you know, older homes versus new construction. Yep, so you can definitely track. Um, so the way that the nice part about the way that all these real estate databases are now is they can tell you sort of every single attribute of the house, at least in terms of how it was constructed, when it's constructed. Um, you know, you can sort of, I mean, it's a little bit harder to tell if it's renovated or not per se, unless there's something in the text, right? Um, you know, to some degree, you might be able to get whether it's insulation or not, which might help you to determine whether it's a four season home. It's really hard to determine from the actual data to say whether it truly is, you know, a second home or a first home, right? You need to get that to track it with something else, which we're a little bit harder to do. Um, but there's ways we can at least try to tease out some of those effects, mm -hmm. um, but maybe, mm -hmm. not, maybe not all of them, right? You can also, I guess, recognize from census data and stuff, they do collect information on like proportion of people that live in a given area uh, that whether or not they're second homes or not. But again, it's gonna be hard to tell that because you don't know then in that respondent whether the people are living on lakes or just somewhat near, nearby, right? Mm -hmm. So that I would say that is, a, that is a limitation if we're largely using just all quasi publicly available data that we're scraping from somewhere, yeah. Right, right. And to sort of um, to bounce off that question, uh, you know, somebody, uh, Kim asked about, um, it, are any, she asked, are any entities capturing the uptick in Airbnb and vacation rentals, you know, which are very different from the old days when you, you know, you had a rental agency and, you know, my family did it. We went to the same house on Little Sebago every year, like where there were those regular people coming, um, you know, having an investment, you know, a, a mental, emotional investment in a house, whereas now, you know, we all bounce around and we love Airbnbs because it gives you all these options. But I, we, I feel like anecdotally, there's a real um, um, a risk to lakes from those properties because number one, the number of rental renters that are squeezing in. The the um the way they treat septic systems, which you know, if you have a long time an old camp, you know to conserve water. You you know you don't take a shower, you do your laundry at the laundromat, all that stuff. So there's that risk, and then um yeah, just the not really caring so much because you're only there for a week and you're never coming back. So any insight on that? Um. Yeah, a little bit. I think you can capture some of that effect on more the survey part where we're going to get at people's expenditures and what they're doing at lakes. You might be able again to capture whether people are doing what, like what you said, Susan, is they used to go to the same place and now they're not, how much they're spending, right? I think some of the other aspect that might be driving up housing prices too is this idea that you can, you know, go there for a month and then the rest of the summer you can pay your mortgage by doing Airbnb. And so that might also be captured in some of these increased housing prices over the, the last couple of years. And so again, you can try to use some statistics to control for some of that. I think we're gonna have to work hard in the survey part to try to capture it more than, more than anything. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, you mentioned in the, uh, you know, in the introduction about the impacts of climate change and what what that's going to do. And I, I don't, I'm not, a, I, I'm not at all familiar with that literature on climate change in the economy, other than sort of the big infrastructure, you know, roads and bridges were washing out and things like that, and, you know, the dest destructive powers of hurricanes and that kind of thing. But, um, you know, and, and actually Adam just asked this too, how are you, how are you seeing so far climate change affecting the valuation of properties or uh, lake values, or is it just too early to yeah to well we haven't we haven't tried to figure that out yet um i guess what you can think about that i mean it works in two ways one is that there could be stressors to infrastructure as a result you know more extreme rain events other things like that you know i toss it back to you know the more sort of lake ecologists and stuff to say how is climate affecting what's growing in the lake right because that comes yeah. back to the clarity side of things but the other flip side is that, you know, Maine, you know, could be, and we sort of saw that, saw that during COVID or whatever, but, but could be a place for sort of climate migration, right? Because we're probably going to, you know, a relatively nicer climate to live in, right? So it actually could come off in, in two different ways where that could then come on to maybe more stressors on Maine's lakes if, again, they're not developed sort of in an appropriate manner. Yeah, yeah. Thank yeah, you. Melissa's going to um, chime in too. Also, yeah. so I also have, I have a climate concentration as well as an economical and environmental. So a lot of the conversation in Maine right now, as you guys have probably seen, is focused around um, the ocean because the Gulf of Maine is warming so much faster than a lot of other areas of ocean. So I think that is also another issue is that that, that particular geographic region is attracting a lot of the attention for climate science in Maine. So lakes and um, inland environments may kind of be a lower priority right now. So hopefully as we go forward, um, that can, we can start to see more focus on lakes as well as the coast. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I can say whenever I see a climate report, like, hey, we, you know, an analysis of climate, it's always like, yeah, right, let's see, like, because I'm always looking for those summaries and right, you know, summaries about lakes and lake impacts. And, you know, sometimes there's some of those national climate reports, like, the word lake isn't even in the in the document so i feel like lakes definitely get short trip but you know that those storm impacts those frequent um more free more intense storms are gonna are having a huge impact on in our lakes so maybe we'll get more attention when you're getting your phd melissa <laughs> um Here's a tech, here's a here's a modeling question for you from uh, Paul Davis. He said, um, "How do you treat com competing and nonlinear values? For example, industrial values versus recreational values. Density affects where density affects where value decreases, aesthetic and water quality, as intensity of use and shoreline development increases." Yep. So that's why we sort of, again, um, you know, I say it's total economic value, but we look at these sort of different components, right? That's why we went through those sort of different boxes where we looked at recreation demand and then housing value or whatever, right? And some of those could be trade-offs or compete with each other. And so that's how we're trying to sort of capture that, right? So the idea of is that, um, you know, potentially what you might see is a lot of people going to a certain area to recreate, right? And the value of recreation goes up until some point that then it goes down because it's too crowded, right? It's, it's so crowded, no one wants to go or whatever they, you know, whatever they say, right? Yep. So that's one way we can capture that. Or again, because of overuse in the recreation side of things, it could degrade quality and then show up in terms of lower values. And again, this is where you need to, you need to look at sort of changes over time because that helps you capture that sort of those dynamic effects uh, as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Clearly, this we need more funding, and um, we're going to be going for a long. <laughs> These are fascinating period. questions, and I might yeah. sound like I'm punting a little bit, but it's like, yeah, it's there's there's a lot of stuff here. Um, if we can get the data, it's it's possible, but it's it's not yeah. that not easy to answer, like in, in you know in two seconds. Yeah, yeah. No, this is great. One more question, and I think we'll let you go. Um, uh, and we're right on time, so that's great. I mean, you packed a lot of information into this webinar. Um, Judy wanted to know, do other lake associations, you know, or do you, in your research on um, uh, properties, do you know how many property owners 
our local versus residents of other states or other regions. So I guess it gets that second home question. Is that in, in those in the in the data that you're looking at the publicly available? Not you don't know if I think people again can maybe speak anecdotally, like maybe from your summer position. <laughs> yeah, um, I think as far as yeah state data that we have, it's not really evident, but um, I think as you know, working for Friends of Cobbacy, where we, we, you do know like who is a seasonal resident and who, like I know we've sent out outreach envelopes and you know, sometimes we're like, oh, they're, they're seasonal because we're sending it to Florida or something like that. Yeah. So yeah, it's hard to, anecdotally we can tell, but it's hard on a big scale, just looking at like points on a computer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lots of the hard questions here. Um, but thank you both for doing this and doing this great work. Um, in terms of that survey that you talked about this fall, if anybody, um, I know you're, you want to buy, you know, an unbiased sample of users and non-users, but we'll, we'll probably be able to have a link to that um, um, on our website. And so if you are listening in and you're a lake user and you want to uh, chime in on that survey this fall, I think I'm not, am I speaking out of turn that I, that we'll be able to have. Yeah, no, that, that's fine. We'll, we'll come up with a way to sort of capture if it's a truly unbiased person that, you know, randomly got it versus I know that a lot of lake associations and stuff are interested in collecting the information. So we can, we can, we can develop it so that it sort of get multi different sort of inputs and, and, and uses. Yeah. Out of it. Great. That's what I thought, but I want to make sure. So yeah, yeah, if you're, if that interests you, keep in touch with us, keep up with our website. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll definitely be doing more on this project. Um, and it sounds like we'll have to have like another webinar in a year or two with more, um, you know, as you pull this together, um, more and more. Um, I, Melissa, Adam just mentioned you're staying on for this project, coming back to this project next year. So, um, you know, we'd love to hear from you again next year. And um, as this unfolds, and um, it's, it, it's a topic that means a lot to, to so many people because it really, um, and I didn't really say this at the beginning, but one of the reasons that that Great Pond Task Force was an economic study was so important was what it does for uh, policy and legislators and municipal officials, because when you can put those numbers on um, the value of lakes, they definitely pay attention. And um, if they may be willing to write it off, oh, it's just, you know, a bunch of people who want to go swimming. But, and then if you put, well, uh, this is what swimming brings to your economy, or to, to your community, it really does help with the policy and advocacy end of, the, of things that um, I think a lot of our listeners are interested in. So thank you again. Thanks everybody for joining us. Hope we see you in a couple of weeks to talk about freshwater education. All right. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Bye.